So last time we were talking about more circles, we kind of ended the ended the class with um, an example where I talked about if you have a if you have a bar and you pull on it in an unconfined way so that that's the first principle stress or sigma one, often the material will fail at some angle of inclination where that angle uh, from the normal stress on the, we'll call it a fault, you know, because it's going to actually be a failure there, a fault in our little sample. Uh, the angle of inclination between the normal of that fault and sigma one is beta. And then we showed how a rotation, if you rotated the stress, you could see that the shear stress was actually a maximum uh, when beta was equal to 45. So it's just sort of a, a way to suggest possibly that the maximum shear stress is a failure criteria. Right? And so um, the more circles just from essentially geometry result in a set of equations um, that look like this where only the function of the minimum and maximum principal stresses, so sigma 1 and sigma 3, uh, and where beta is this sort of angle of the fault or angle between sigma 1, then you can determine um, what the shear and normal stresses are on the fault. But more useful in practice is going to be we're going to go to the lab and we're going to do confined triaxial testing, right? We talked about the different types of tests that you do on a rock, right? So we're going to go to the lab, we're going to do triaxial testing where we're going to vary the amount of confinement that's on the sample, the, this, the, you know, the, the lateral confinement, so that's the sigma 2 equals sigma 3, and then vary the axial confinement, sigma 1, and with that, if we do a series of tests at different sigma 1, sigma 3 values, we can basically plot all of those more circles on a, on a, on a um, you know, no, normal, this is a sigma n, so normal versus shear, you know, where these intersect, where these guys intersect, uh, sigma 1 and sigma 3 intersect this guy, then we can plot all these series of circles, and from that, if we sketch a line that's tangent to all those circles, right, then this is what we call the failure envelope. Okay, so if you remember from when I did give that little demonstration where I said the state of stress is sort of always inside that that large circle, so basically what that implies here is that you know anything under this line is a valid state of stress, and anything above it is invalid, okay? So you can't even really be out here in terms of, you know, if you were to compute some, some uh, normal and shear that would put you out here, that's just, it's invalid. You'd never get there because as soon as you hit the line, you're going to fail the material, right? So you're either inside it, in which case you're elastic, or you're sitting right on the surface, in which case you're in a state of incipient failure. Okay. <clears throat> and so, of course, a couple of other observations. When, uh, when sigma 3 is equal to 0, that's an unconfined test, right? There's no lateral confinement. So when sigma 3 is equal to 0, then whatever value at sigma 1 that touches this line where it fails, then this is called the unconfined progressive stress. Right? So remember, so this curve here is touching our failure envelope. It's touching our failure envelope, and therefore, uh, and it has zero, um, it has zero sigma three, so that means that sigma one is the unconfined compressive strain. And in Zobach's book, or in, in a lot of other literature, you often see that listed as C zero, right? So this is the unconfined compressive strength. And you guys have already done some tests 
right? In your first lab, that's what essentially what you were solving for or looking at, right? The unconfined compressors for HBA lab, right? So you do a series of these tests, and you develop, and you just trace this curve, and you develop this more envelope, okay? Well, let's go back one. You can see that it's not an awful approximation if we were to just draw a straight line through those labs, right? So that the point where, you know, the best fit to where the straight line touched the tangent points of all the circles, or, the, you know, the best point, the best fit of all the circles. So in other words, if you, let me redraw it a little better, a little more accurately. So if you took the tangent points of where the real more, more envelope, and then you did a best fit to those in terms of a straight line. Sorry, that's not a really straight line. But then that would be not an awful approximation and would lead to a simple model that we're going to call, you know, ultimately the more Coulomb failure criterion. Uh, in this case, you know, I have it labeled the linearized more envelope because it's just sort of the best fit straight line to the real envelope, okay? And it turns out, you know, here's our, here's our figure again. Um, here's, our, here's our figure again that the point where this line now touches each of the more circles, that angle is 2 beta, okay? And so then with this guy, we have a line, and the slope of this line we're going to call mu, so that's the, called the coefficient of internal friction, and where it intercepts the shear axis, we're going to call that S0, and this is called the cohesion, right? And so this is sort of, it's not something you can really measure, cohesion, uh, but you can kind of think of what it, what it is, and the, the whole model eventually, initially came from sort of un unconsolidated sands or or clay type sands, and you can imagine that a clay, for example, you know, it, it sort of sticks together e even under no normal stress. There's, there's some, it can withstand some shear stress, like it, it sticks together, right? You know, whereas like a, a truly, completely unconsolidated sand doesn't. It doesn't really stick together. There's no cohesion, right? But if it has a little bit of a little bit of consolidation like a clay or, you know, or, or a saturated sand, like beach sand, you know, with, with, like when you go to the beach and you saturate the sand. In that case, it sort of sticks together and it can withstand a little bit of shear under no normal stress. Or so this is sort of that, the instantaneous sort of shear strength of the material, you know, when you apply an instantaneous normal stress, right? How much shear can it withstand? Okay. So, it's not physically measurable, okay? But, and this is sort of where the utility of these more circles come in. Remember, when, when uh, sigma three, when the, when the smallest principal stress is zero, it's an unconfined test, where this crosses the normal axis is the, is the unconfined compressive strength, C zero. This is measurable. You guys measured it, right? So, with C0 and just the geometry of these circles, with C0, well, we know that this point here is 2 beta. We have an equation that relates, you know, that angle 2 beta to tau and the, norm, and the normal stresses, those two equations that I showed at the beginning. And ultimately, then we can just, through geometry, we can determine what S0 is as a function, as a function of C0 and mu, and I'll show what those equations are in a minute, okay? So C0 we can measure, you, you guys have measured it, and from that you can, you can come up with at what S0 is, okay? But then, you know, we just have essentially, with S, if we know what S0 and mu are, S0 is the y-intercept, mu is the slope, we can write the equation of a line. So our, so our failure model just becomes a, 
straight line or equation of a line. So there it is, right? That's just the equation of the line. So, so the shear stress is equal to the cohesion plus the normal stress times the angle of internal friction. And the cohesion is related to the unconfined compressive strength like this. So in other words, you just have to solve this equation for S0 and you plug it in there. And then you have an equation that's a function of something you can measure. And this you can't really measure, but you can fit the data. You know, it's the slope of that line. And so this should look familiar because it's it's almost, you know, what what if S zero is, is what if S zero is zero? Have you seen something that looks like that before? Slipping on a fault, right? So, you know, the, the idea there is when the ratio of the shear stress, uh, when the, so when there's no cohesion, when there's no cohesion, it's like there's no, you know, there's no shear, there's no shear stress at zero normal stress, right? So the, it's the same line that just passes through the zero, right? It just passes through zero, and then we. You know, we had this criteria that said when the ratio of the shear stress to the normal stress exceeds the internal friction angle, then the fault will slip. Right? Well, it's sort of the same idea here is that, you know, when the ratio of the shear stress minus the cohesion divided by the normal stress is greater than the internal friction, then the material will fail. Right? So now, there's not an existing fault. We're, we're going to create a fault through material failure, essentially. So there's other ways to look at the problem. Um, we can go and, and you know plot it, plot the data this way. In other words, so we go to the lab and we uh, plot. You know, we vary S1 and S3, and we, and we do a series of tests. And where the material fails, we put a dot on the, on that, on the plot, right? So we vary S1 and S3, and we put a dot, we put a dot, we put a dot. And then if you fit a straight line to those, and the fact that they are fit with a straight line is a pretty good indication that the more Coulomb failure criterion is a decent one. In other words, if they're not, if they're all over the place or they're not fitting on a straight line like this, it's probably the more Coulomb criteria is probably not a good one. Remember, this is just a model. This is a model. This is something that we as engineers came up with to represent the material failure of rocks. And it does a pretty good job, OK? But it's not always going to be perfect. But in the case where it fits a pretty straight line like this, then, um, you, know, then you have a, a, a good estimation of, uh, you know that the model is a pretty decent one. And then from the slope of that line on the S1, S3 curve, again, in just geometry, uh, you, can, you can come up with how in the slope of this line relates to the internal friction angle. Okay. And what is this point right here? 94.3. Just read the plot, right? That's when S3 is 0, it's the value of S1. C0, it's the unconfined compressive strength, right? When S3 is 0, there's no lateral confinement. It's the unconfined compressive strength. It's what you guys have measured in the lab. OK. So here's some real data um, it, you know, for sandstone. And you can see that you know, the, real, the real Moore envelope in other words, how it the real Moore envelope, how it act, you know the, if you draw the actual tangent line to the to the curves, then it's like that, or uh, you know the linearized one. The linearized one is there, 
So you can see at low, at low principal stress differences, they're pretty, in this region, right, they're, they're pretty good. Right? But if you get to very high principal stress differences, so that your Mohr circle is very large, right, then the, the, the real Mohr failure envelope and the, and the linearized one diverge a little bit. Right? So th this might suggest that in this region, you're okay to use a linearized model, and out here, you might need to use something more complex. Okay. In this class, in terms of actually solving problems, all we'll ever use is the linearized more Gluon model because it's really the only one that's simple enough to sort of solve some problems by hand or with simple MATLAB scripts. When you go to like full blown, you know, really complex models, you, you really have to go to full blown sort of, you know, finite element type simulations or you know more complex. Things. So in this class, in terms of solving problems, we'll talk about some of the other models, but in terms of solving problems, we'll only ever use the linearized more Coulomb failure curve thing. So here's some real data for uh, cohesion and, and uh, internal friction strength. So, so this is the cohesion over here, and this is uh, internal friction strength here, and I guess what what uh, is sort of interesting about this. So the, you know these are lots of different different types of rocks, and you can see that while there's quite a bit of scatter in terms of the strength here, the cohesive strength here, there's quite a bit of s scatter here. The scatter here is not as wide in terms of you know this is you know from no cohesion. So even a material like, like this that has essentially no cohesion, it, it has some internal friction. And what that implies is when I put it under pressure, I mean, I think even, even you can sort of imagine this um, uh, just, just by intuition, right? Even if I take loose beach sand, right? It essentially has no cohesion. But if I compact it, right, if I compact it, squeeze it really tight under pressure, and then I apply a shear, so if I compact it and then, then I take my compaction hand and I, and I shear it like that, there's going to be some resistance. There's going to be some resistance, and that resistance arises due to the internal friction. Okay? Whereas, you know, if I, if I take that loose beach sand and I don't compact it, I just hold it in my hand and I